Um, today, I'm really very happy to present to you our distinguished speaker, Dr. Moshe Vardy, who is the George Professor in Computational Engineering at Rice University. Dr. Vardy has had a very illustrious career. It has included working at the IBM Almaden Research Center and then serving, going, coming to Rice University and serving for a little bit more than eight years as department head and chair of the computer science department. Currently at Rice, he serves as the director of the Ken Kennedy Institute for Information Technology. It's very hard to, to make a short introduction of, uh, of Moshe and his accomplishments because he's please earned... Tr please try anyway. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's earned so many awards, and I, I just have to tell you some of them. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the European Academy of Sciences. He's the recipient of many awards for his research, including the year 2000 Gödel Prize. This is a very prestigious theoretical computer science prize. The 2005 ACM Canalakis Award for Theory and Practice. The Logic in CS Conferences Test of Time Award for his work. And that's, that's one of these awards where you don't get it when you do the work, you get it later when people see the impact of the work. So this is a very, very coveted award by many people and the 2008 ACM uh, SIGMOD COD Innovations Award. And these are just some of them. Last week, uh, in, uh, he arranged to receive an award from the IEEE Computer Society to help us advertise his talk here. The 2011 Harry H. Goody Memorial Award. Uh, and the quote on this award is, for fundamental and lasting contributions to the development of logic as a unifying foundational framework and a tool for modeling computational systems. But Moshe has many sides besides professional service as a department head at Rice. Uh, he also has done outstanding professional service to ACM. Many gets as a communications of ACM. Everyone gets as a member of ACM. A few years ago, um, this magazine was languishing. Members were getting it. Few people were reading it. There was not much of great interest to the combined practitioner research community. I think the, the, the sole uh, energizing and unifying and organizational force is right here. Dr. Vardy took on the editor-in-chief position and totally refashioned this as a magazine that has interesting viewpoints, articles from the research community that are prefaced by explanations and context uh, for why they're important, uh, news articles, contributions, announcements, etc. And now, basically, ACM members rate this in our membership surveys, I know this as vice president, rate this as one of the positive aspects of membership. And it is due in no small part to this individual's efforts. So I'm, I'm very gratified he found time to come up here from Texas and to uh, elucidate us with his thoughts on logic this morning. Dr. Vardy. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind invitation and the kind introduction. It's a, my first visit here, so it's always a pleasure. Um, very often people tell you in a lecture, what, what did I do over my last summer vacation? And I will try to give a bit broader perspective. I'll try to describe to you what happened over the last 2,500 years. <laughs> so I'm going to talk to you about logic and computer science. And I'll start with a quote uh, of, of Georg Gottlob, a founder of software company, professor at Oxford. He said, computer science is the continu continuation of logic by other means. This is a par paraphrase of a very famous quote. Anybody knows? Hmm? Right, for Clausewitz, war is the continu continuation of diplomacy by other means. Now, this connection between logic and computer science actually is a bit puzzling if you think about it. Logic is one of the oldest intellectual disciplines. Computer science is one of the youngest intellectual disciplines. We think of computer science as, as dynamic and exciting. We think of, most people think of logic as dusty and boring. What is the connection? Uh, Mr. Cosma Arshalizi, on a website I found out a few years ago, talking about logic, said, if in 1901, a talented and sympathetic outsider had been called upon, said by a grant given agency, to survey the sciences and name the branch that would be the least fruitful in the century ahead, his choice might well have set upon mathematical logic. 
an exceedingly recondite field whose practitioner could all have fit into a small auditorium. It had no practical application, not even much mathematics to show for itself. Its current was exceedingly uh, obscure definition of cardinal numbers, whatever they are. But before trying to answer these questions about what is the relation between logic and computer science, we want to ask a more fundamental question. What is logic? It's actually not easy to define logic. It goes back to a Greek word that means logos just means word. What is logic? So for that, we may want to go to the most famous logician of all times, the Reverend Charles Ludwig Jordson, also known as Lewis Carroll. Lewis Carroll. So in Alice Through the Looking Glass, we find the definition. Contrarywise, continued twiddle D. If it was so, it might be. If it were so, it would be. But as it isn't, it ain't. That's logic. <laughs> this is a 19th century definition. If you want a 20th century definition, you can find it in a book by Andrea Nye, a feminist author, Words of Power. She says, logic is the creation of defensive male subjects. Yes, I'm talking about you who have lost touch with their lived experience and define all being in rigid propositional categories modeled on a primal contract between male and female. But if you want a serious definition, we have to go back, way back to this guy, the most influential intellectual of all times, someone whose wisdom stood unchallenged for almost 2,500 years. And this is Aristotle who lived in the, in the, in the fourth century BC. So the Greeks uh, love debating, but Aristotle want to understand what distinguish philosopher, philosopher literally means lover of wisdom, from a demagogue. Demagogue literally means leader of the people. Dema is the people, democracy, demagogue, leader of the people. What does distinguish philosophy from demagoguery? 2,000 years later, Francis Bacon would put it very nicely, it's a logic differs from rhetoric in this, that logic handles reason exactly in truth, and rhetoric handles it as a planted in popular opinions and manners. So Aristotle wanted to find the truth. And he made an astounding discovery. The truth comes out of form. Now, we typically think of form as something superficial. To get to the truth, we have to go inside. But Aristotle realized the truth come out of form. And he identified the syllogisms. Lewis Carroll later called them the syllogisms. But Aristotle called them the syllogisms, which are patterns of reasoning. So here is an example. All humans are mortal. All Greeks are human. Therefore, all Greeks are mortal. We look at it and we say, this is a very valid form of reasoning. But here is another form of reasoning. All bujums are slithy. All toves are bujums, therefore all toves are slithy. And you must recognize that this is equally valid, even though you probably have never seen a bojum, a bojum and you don't know what is a tov, and you have no idea why they are slithy. Nevertheless, this is a valid form of reasoning because of the form. This is why we talk about formal logic. Forms give rise to truth. The Greeks also discover the paradoxes. Paradoxes are give us, it's a wonderful tool to sharpen our understanding of some logical phenomenon. We are familiar with the paradox of Zeno, that in some sense you can say ultimately gave rise to the calculus. And the most famous paradox of all is, the, is the, called the liar's paradox, attributed to Epimenides, who was a Cretan, and he said all Cretans are liars. In fact, we find it in the New Testament, the epistle of St. Paul to Titus 1.12, one of themselves, a prophet of their own, said Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy glutons. In fact, we can go to the Old Testament. We find in Psalms 116.11, everyone is a liar. But to really make it into a paradox, you have to sharpen it. And this is due to you, Bullides, who gave us what we know today is this sentence is false. And... Um, if you think about it, you realize if it's false, it must be true. If it's true, it must be false. What's going on here? Uh, it's really interesting to give it to children and to see at what age they realize that there is something wrong going on here. So I've run a kind of experiments. Age 10 seems to be a bit too young for them. 
but somewhere between, I think, 10 and 13, they realize there is a problem. So you can all go home and try it at home. Now, of course, we understand today that the problem here is the sentence refers to itself. We also call it, in a technical language, the term diagonalization referring to the diagonal of a matrix. And we will see the self-reference will be a tool that will, will be a constant theme across this lecture for the next 2,000 years. We will talk about self-reference. What happens <coughs> after the Greeks? We, we typically don't think of the medieval uh, scholarship as having made much contribution, but I must mention Ramon Lul. Ramon Lul was a, a Catalan monk who was actually rather sinful as a young man and then had an epiphany, became very religious, and wanted to convert the whole world to Christianity. And here is an argument using logic in favor of the Trinity. So please listen very carefully and follow. If in thy three property there are no differences, the demonstration would give the D to the H of the A with the F and the G, as it does with the E. And yet the K would not give significant of the H of any defect in the F or the G. But since diversity is shown in demonstration, the D makes of the E and the F with the G and the I and the K, therefore the H has certain scientific knowledge of thy holy and glorious trinity. Clear? <laughs> if you couldn't follow, don't, don't feel bad. You're not the only one. Here is again Francis Bacon. Some persons, more ostentatious and learned, have labored about a kind of a method not to worthy to be called a legitimate method, begging rather a method of imposture, which nevertheless would, would no doubt be very acceptable to meddling wits. Such was the art of Lul. In fact, if you think it was funny, here is a Renaissance painting. It's called The Stoning of the Philosopher Ramon Lul. And he went to North Africa to convert them to Christianity. And they so much disliked this kind of arguments that they stoned him to death. He was over eight years old when he was stoned to death. So why are we mentioning Ramon Lul? So in fairness, I was making a bit too much fun of him. All these letters were actually abbreviation for some assertions. And Ramon, Ramon Lul realized that as you're making logical reasoning, you have to do case analysis. And if you generate all cases, and just generating all the cases can be hard. Today we call it combinatorial explosion. So he devised a system in his book. The book was called Ars Magna Generalis and Ultima. It means a great general and ultimate art. It's a nice title for a book. He described a system where you have these pieces of paper, and you can put them on a, on a you could put a pin in the center, and you can rotate them and generate the different combinations. Now, this may seem to us, that's just a, what, I mean, this is just, we're not very impressed by having a little moving pieces of paper, but what was new here that Ramon Lul realized that reasoning needs mechanical aid. This is the beginning, the beginning, very, very early beginning of mechanization of reasoning. And if we now jump a few hundred years, and we're going to find Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. He's, very, he's known as the co-inventor of, of the calculus. The other person was, was Newton, Isaac Newton. But also Leibniz uh, invented binary notation, which means he is an inventor of the bit. So people describe him in some sense as a made very important contribution to computer science. Leibniz was a prodigy. He taught himself Latin at, at age eight, started reading Aristotle, and he wrote two theses. One is Aristotelian metaphysics, and one is logic in the law. And he discovered Lul, and he was very excited. He wrote, when I was young, I found pleasure in the Lulian art. And out of this Lul's primitive idea of mechanical aid to reasoning, Leibniz came up with this is, this is 17th century. Leibniz came up with an amazing idea. He wanted to develop a universal mathematical language. He called it lingua characteristica universalis, in which you'll be able to express all human knowledge. And there will be rules, calculational rules, calculus ratio sinator, reasoning calculus. And Leibniz not only developed the calculus for, for analysis, 
for, for what we call the differential integral calculus, but also he built calculators, so he knew about calculating machines, and he thought that he can, will be able to develop calculating machines for reasoning. And he wrote, if controversies were to arise, there would be no more need of disputation between two philosophers than between two accountants. For it would suffice to take their pencils in their hands and say to each other, calculemos, let us calculate. So he's saying reasoning can be reduced to calculation. Amazing idea, given the time. Leibniz did not get to carry up out his dream uh, too far. Unlike his competitor, Isaac Newton, he did not have an academic position. He was the librarian of the Duke of Braunschweig, and his main task was to construct the family tree of the, Braun of the Braunschweig family, and that means he spent most of his time traveling in Europe and reading in dusty archives to extract you know, all, the, all the obscure cousins of the, of the Duke. And much of what he wrote was not published in his lifetime. Uh, the story is that when he died, only his secretary attended his funeral. And really, today we think of Leibniz as a great scientist, but much of it happened only in the late 19th and early 20th century. So we don't see much follow-up to Leibniz, but we have to jump ahead about 150 years, and we meet George Bull, who was described as a man of acutest intellect and manifold learning. I just love this. If, if I can put a, a request on my gravestone, this would be very nice. George Bull uh, was born in 19th century England. His father was a shoemaker. In 19th century England, if your father was a shoemaker, what are you going to be? Shoemaker. But he was just a very, very bright boy. At age 12, his father got into a huge dispute with the headmaster because uh, Bull George translated a, an ode by Horace from Latin to English, and translation was so impressive that the headmaster said he must have found it somewhere, on the web, maybe. <laughs> and and uh, the father was very insulted that, that, that his son's integrity was impugned. He taught himself mathematics, started tutoring other students, eventually started tutoring teachers, eventually becoming a professor of mathematics in Cork, Ireland, in Queen's College in Cork, Ireland. Recently, there is a fight. The house in which you live still exists, but it's a bit old now, and the city wanted to demolish it, and there was some petition to save the House of Bull. Now, the 19th century is the, is the century of algebra, in some sense. Algebra from just a notation, from doing arithmetic, to algebra as a general discipline. And what Bull realized is that logic can be algebraized. So he realized that all of the syllogisms are about classes of objects, and we can manipulate such classes algebraically. So here is a, an example. Let's read the text. If an adjective as good is employed as a term of description, let us represent by letter as y, all things to which the description good is applicable, i.e. all good things, the class of good things. Let it further be agreed that by the combination x times y, here we use juxtaposition for multiplication, shall be represented, the, that class of thing to which the name of description represent by x and y are simultaneously applicable. Thus, if x alone stands for white things and y for sheep, that x times y represent, stand for white sheep. So he is essentially saying logical conjunction and can be thought of as a form of multiplication. Now, what was his goal? His goal was incredibly audacious. Introduction to his book, The Mathematical Analysis of Logic, 1847, he writes, the design of the following treatise is to investigate the fundamental laws of the operations of the mind. Really, if you think about cognitive science, this is the beginning of cognitive science. If somebody wants to have a mathematical theories for the mind. This was such an audacious uh, goal that after uh, Bull uh, died, no one took it, no one dared to continue with this until almost 100 years later when Pitts and McCullough came up with neural nets again as a mathematical model for the brain. Now what, what Bull demonstrated is the usefulness of the algebraic approach. 
And here is one little example. He said conjunction is idempotent because white and white is just white. So we have a new axiom, x equal x times x, and our little algebraic manipulation, x minus x, x is zero. We factor x out, means x times one minus x is zero. And this bull said, oh, this is actually very important. This is the principle of contradiction. that says that something cannot be true and false at the same time. Right? This is the most, a very fundamental proof principle, proof by contradiction. And he says, Bull says, x times one minus x is zero expresses the principle of contradiction, which Aristotle has described as the most fundamental axiom of all philosophy. Most fundamental thing. Something cannot be true and false at the same time. Bull, again, did not get to carry his, his life project too far. At age 49, he walked to give a lecture in Ireland. He got, it was raining. He forgot his umbrella. He got wet. He got pneumonia. Came home with high fever. His wife had the belief that the remedy has to be similar to the cause of the disease. So she put him in bed and poured on him a bucket of ice water. And that did not help. So he died, he left a, a family that was rather impoverished. He had a young girl, Alice, she was four years old when he died, she barely remembered him. She grew up in a very poor family, became a secretary, got married, had children, but had a little hobby, four-dimensional geometry. So without ever even having high school education, he started corresponding with a professor in the Netherlands, and he started publishing papers together, and she ended up getting an honorary degree from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. So this was a good family. Now what happens after, after Bull dies young? Uh, his follower is William Stanley Givons. Givons had a, a, a complicated relationship with Bull. He was younger than Bull. Uh, he's Bull in his 40s. Uh, Givons is 20 years younger. He writes letter to, to, to Bull in which he very aggressively challenges Bull on this point or that point, and Bull actually answer to, answers him very, very kindly. So it turns out that what we call today Boolean algebra were really developed by Givons, not by Bull. So let's read from Bull's articles. He writes, I have given much attention, therefore, to lessening both the manual and mental labor of the process. What is the process? Logical reasoning. So remember, even even uh, Lul already realized that logical reasoning is hard. And now, Givons uh, tried to do something about it. He said, I shall describe several devices which may be adopted for saving trouble and risk of mistake. What are the devices? Here is a device. It's a logic machine. It's a machine that can do logical reasoning. It can reason ab about four propositions. So you realize the state space is two to the four is 16 something that we can almost do in our head. But if you think you can do it using wood, moving wood pieces, it's, a, it's not a trivial challenge. So uh, this machine, I think, still exists in some museum in, in the UK. And Givons is very excited. And he writes, as I woke in the morning, the sun was shining brightly into my room. There was a consciousness on my mind that I was the discoverer of a true logic of the future. For a few minutes, I felt such a delight, such as one can seldom hope to feel. So if you're a graduate student working on your dissertation, that's the way you're supposed to feel every morning. Now, I want you to remember, this is a machine that has moving wooden pieces, can reason about four Boolean propositions. And look what Givens is thinking about. He said, the machine represents a mind endowed with power of, of thoughts, but wholly devoid of knowledge. It cannot be asserted, indeed, that the machine entirely supersedes the agency of conscious thought. And the final remark is very ironic. He writes, I must remark, these mechanical devices are not likely to possess much practical utility. Why? We do not require common life to be constantly solving complex logical questions. Now, why is this ironic? Because if this is the first logic machine, if you want logic, logic machine, logic piano 1.0, this is, you can say, this, is, this would be the logic piano 100.0, right? We have some people here, electrical engineering. If you ask them, 
you know, what is this? The answer is, this is logic, right? This is the logic of the circuit. So this transition from logic as a branch of philosophy to logic to build machine, how did it happen? So the conventional wisdom attributed this to a very bright young student, Claude Elwood Shannon. Now many of you have heard of Shannon. He's the famous for developing information theory. But he did that when he was old, when he was 28. What did he do when he was young? So at age 21, Shannon publishes his master's thesis titled A Symbolic Analysis of Relay and Switching Circuits. And what is it about? Shannon realized the connection between circuits and logic and Boolean algebra. Why? Because a circuit can be a switch, can be on or off. This is, you can think of it as one or zero. And you can connect circuits in sequence, and this is conjunction, or you connect them in parallel, and this is disjunction. This is or. So basically, Bull realized that, that Boolean algebras and Boolean logic give you a mathematical theory for circuits. And this is what the thesis was about. Hermann Goldstein, we're going to meet him in a few minutes again as the project manager of the ENIAC. He wrote, this thesis helped to change circ digital circuit design from art to science. If you open today any book on logical design, a lot of logic there, how to design Boolean circuits. Howard Gardner, a famous psychologist in, in uh, Harvard, wrote possibly the most important and also the most famous master thesis of the century. But I think actually this is to me historically questionable because if you wrote a master thesis even at MIT, it wasn't widely known, it wasn't on the web. Today you can find a copy, a nice copy on the web, but people probably didn't know about it immediately. In fact, Atanasov and Zeus, who were the first people to build computers in the 30s, they went on record, they never, never heard of Bull, they never heard of his work, didn't stop them from, from building computers. And this is true for all the early pioneers, many of them did never heard of Bull. Here is a quote from a book called Digital Design 1971. Bull and algebra was something less than a major influence in the invention and design of early electronic computer. The 1950s were well underway before the algebra was used at all at some of the major pioneering electronic computer organizations. At the same time, it turns out that this connection between Boolean algebra and circuits had occurred earlier to other people. And so first of all, like for example, we know from interviews that Max Newman, who was a British mathematician who built the, the Colossus in uh, Bletchley Park in the UK to break the uh, German codes, uh, they knew about also, they didn't know about Bull, but they made a connection between, between, between Bull and algebra and circuits. And then we can find actually papers that also publish it, never mentioning Bull. Shostakov in 41, Nakashima and, and uh, Hanzawa in 36, all the way back to Paul Ehrenfest in 1910, made a connection between circuits and Bull and algebra. In fact, we can even go back to the 19th century. And we can find there Charles Saunders Peirce, who was considered the greatest intellect ever lived in, in the American continent. He, was, he has, was active as a mathematician, as an astronomer, chemist, geodetist, surveyor, cartographer, metrologist, spectroscopist, engineer, inventor, psychologist, philologist, lexicographer, historian of science, mathematical economist, lifelong student of medicine, book reviewer, dramatist, actor, so story writer, phenomenologist, semiotician, logician, rhetorician, and metaphysicians, of course, all this in his spare time. Now, you can imagine we can talk a lot about, about Charles Sonder Peirce, but I won't, but I want to go to his students. In 1886, Alain Mancad, Peirce students, published an article in the Proceedings of the American Academy of Arts and Science. The title is A New Logical Machine. And this article, a Marcan described an improvement on Givon's logical machine. The article attracted some attention. Charles Kendall Adams, who was the president of Cornell, wrote, Dear Sir, please accept my thanks for your new logical machine. Could you invent a machine that will do the, the work of a college president? I give you my order in advance. Peirce also read the article and liked it, and he writes to Marcan. 
And he says, this is very nice. But first, it's time to you start th thinking about more than four propositions. It's time to do really hard mathematical problems. And it's time to move away from wood, moving wooden pieces. It's time to use the new technology, electricity. And he goes on to describe how to build circuits for doing addition and multiplication, essentially using construction in series and in parallel to do end and all. So at this point, really, Bull uh, uh, Peirce realized that you can use logic to do arithmetic. And nobody, as far as we know, nobody built these machines. Peirce was a philosopher. He never, he never uh, built anything. He just published voluminously. But in his mind, he knew how to do this. So he writes, a logical machine is a machine which, being fed with premises, produces the necessary conclusion from them. The value of logical machines to lie in their showing how far reasoning is a mechanical process. So we started with, with Lul, who suggested mechanical aid. Then we had Leibniz, who dreamt of reducing reasoning to computation. And now, Per says, reasoning is a mechanical process. And he says, calculating machines are specialized logic machines. If you can do logic, you can do computation. And he goes on to think again, and this is still, we're still struggling with this question today. It's the problem of artificial intelligence. How intelligence can, it, can this machine do? Can they replace us? Okay. Somebody pointed out that uh, just uh, middle of April, Skynet was supposed to take over. Precisely, here is what he writes. Precisely how much the business of thinking a machine could possibly make to perform and what part of it must be left to the living mind is a question not without considerable practical importance. The study of it, at any rate, not fail to throw needed light on the nature of the reasoning process. I sometimes show this quote to people and said, who said it? And some people say, you know, John McCarthy, or maybe Alan Turing. It's really hard to believe this was said in 1887. Now I'm going to make a switch. So in some sense, what we saw so far, we went from, from philosophy to building computers. And, and the, key, the key step was turning logic from philosophy to mathematics. But the word mathematical logic really has two meanings. One is we're going to look at logic using mathematical tools. But the other one is we're going to look at mathematics using logical tools. This is the next theme of this talk. And I will start with a quote by Eugene, uh, by telling you first about Eugene Wigner. Eugene Wigner was a, a famous uh, a physicist or chemist, and he won the Nobel Prize, I think, in chemistry in 1963. And in 1960, he wrote a very well-cited article. It's called On the Unreasonableness, On the Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. And he starts by quoting Euclid, who said, the laws of nature are but the mathematical thoughts of God. And Galileo, who said, the universe cannot be read until we have learned the language and become familiar with the character in which it is written. It is written in a mathematical language. And the letters are triangles, circles, and other geometrical figures, without which it is humanly impossible to comprehend a single word. And he goes on and on to show how effective is mathematics in the natural sciences and end up with what he called the empirical law of epistemology. Epistemology is the theory of knowledge, which is the, the mathematical formulation of the laws of nature is appropriate and accurate. Mathematics is the correct language for formulating the laws of nature. Now, some people went on to ask, why is that? Why should the universe be mathematical? Where did the universe learn calculus? But I'm going to ask another question. There was a hidden assumption here that by using mathematics as a foundation for the natural sciences, we make them more robust, more reliable. And in fact, if you think about all the intellectual disciplines, mathematics we usually would consider to be as the most reliable of them, with the most solid conclusion, unassailable conclusion. And why is that? What is so unique about mathematics? Well, every other discipline may have evidence, demonstrations. Mathematics has, the only discipline has proofs. 
What is a proof? A proof is an argument that is so airtight, it leaves no room for doubt. Some people describe it as the high road to truth. And to understand the importance of, of proofs, we, again, we have to go back more than 2,000 years until we find Euclid. Can it describe as the most influential mathematician of all times? Not the best mathematician. In fact, he was not considered to be an original mathematician. But he wrote a textbook called Elements, which has been used almost unchanged since then. Maybe with better fonts, but not, better, not much better content. In fact, if you think of, your own high, you think of your own high school education, what did you do? You did plain geometry. You had to do it rigorously. You couldn't say, these two triangles, they seem to be congruent. You had to prove they're congruent. And there could be no hole in your argument. If there was a hole in your argument, you lost points. And we also learned algebra and some calculus and trigonometry. And there you were given recipes. And if you ask why, the teacher would usually say, because I told you so. <laughs> and for many years, geometry was the queen of mathematics. And then there was this, this uh, pedestrian discipline that told you, gave you a bunch of recipes, but nobody knew why they worked. And there was a revolution in the middle of the 19th century. So first of all, plain geometry was dethroned. Euclidean geometry was dethroned because people discovered they are non-Euclidean geometries and they are just as good and correct as Euclidean geometries. And, and calculus, which was a bizarre set of recipes, was finally put by a sequence of people, Bolzano, Cauchy, Cantor, Dedekind, Weierstrass, put on formal foundations. Except that if you look at the formal foundations for calculus, at the very heart of it, you find the concept of limit, and the concept of limit is intimately tied to the concept of infinity, and that suddenly put the questions, can we have rigorous proof with this bizarre concept of infinity stuck at the very heart of them. And the concept of infinity is problematic. Again, we go back to Aristotle, who said, infinitum actu non dato. There's no actual infinity. You can go to the limit, but you never get to the limit. But even St. Augustine in the 14th century disagreed. And he said, individual numbers are finite, but its class are infinite. Does that mean that God does not know all the numbers because of their infinity? No one could be insane enough to say that. There must be infinitely, infinitely numbers, and God knows that. So there's actual infinity. Amir Aksel, in his wonderful book, The Mystery of the Aleph, Aleph is a mathematical symbol for infinity, wrote, first discovered by the Greeks between the 5th and the 6th century BC, essentially the, the paradox of Zeno are all paradoxes about the infinite, he said the concept of infinity was so overwhelming, so bizarre, so contrary to every human intuition, that it confounded that ancient philosopher and mathematician who discovered it, causing pain, insanity, and at least one murder we know of. <laughs> a, stu a student of, of Pythagoras was drowned by his fellow students because of a debate about the foundation of mathematics. And then, in 1874, Georg Cantor proves there are infinitely many infinities. Not only the infinity is problematic, now there are infinitely many distinct infinitive, infinities, and the proof uses diagonalization. I once tried to explain it to my brother-in-law. That did not go well. <laughs> so now, a philosophical debate becomes a mathematical debate. What is acceptable mathematics? And you find it, it splits the mathematician into two classes, those who like infinity and those who hate infinity. Leibniz loved it. I'm so in favor of the actual infinite, that instead of admitting that nature abhors it, I hold that nature makes frequent use of it everywhere. Gauss hated it. I protest above all the use of an infinite quantity as a completed one, which in mathematics is never allowed. Verboten, never allowed. Kronecker was a very conservative German mathematician. He saw the bolzano warschau theorem uses the infinite. He said, obvious sophism. This is not a proof. Hilbert loved it. No one shall be able to expel us from the paradise that Cantor created for us. To this very day, some people refer to set theory as the Cantorian paradise. And Frege said, this is, we must resolve this. He said, for the infinite, 
will eventually refuse to be excluded from arithmetic. Thus, we can foresee that this issue will provide for a momentous and decisive battle. This was not a mere intellectual battle. In the 1920s, this turned out to be a huge, personal, ugly dispute. On one hand, you have David Hilbert. We're going to meet him again in a few minutes. He's the editor-in-chief of Mathematische Annalen, which is the mathematical journal of the time. On the other hand, uh, you have uh, uh, the Dutch mathematician Braver, who represents the people who question the traditional methods of mathematics. And Hilbert accuses Braver of trying to, to, to destroy mathematics. He wants to, to expel him from the editorial board. And this huge debate erupts on the editorial board. Every editor must take side, Hilbert says. You are with us or against us. And, and uh, ever, only one editor refused to take side. His name was Albert Einstein. As you know, he was a pacifist. He says, I will not get dragged into the war between the mice and the frogs. <laughs> Here is Frege. Ludwig, Friedrich Ludwig Gottlob Frege, described by some people as the second most important logician after Aristotle. So what was, what was so important about Frege's work? So the 19th century is a century that people start to think about what, is the, the, what are the foundations of mathematics. Until then, mathematics is something that people do. But now people start to question, partly because of results such as Cantor in this debate, people start thinking about the foundation of mathematics. And in particular, Frege writes a little book called Begriffsschritt, which is a language for concept. And he proposed, he asked the following question, what is the language of mathematics? Does the mathematics have a language? And the answer is yes. And he proposed what we essentially what we call today first order logic. Let's say mathematics has objects. You have relationships, predicates like less than. You have operations, functions, plus, times. You have logical operations, a la boule, boolean operations. And quantifier were introduced by, in fact, by, by Peirce. Peirce introduced the quantifier for all that exist. So now we can go back to Aristotle. You can take, take a statement saying all men, all men are mortal. And precisely it means for all x, if x is a man, then x is mortal. And the modern notation is we use the inverted a as the quantifier for all. So we say for all x, men of x implies mortal of x. So essentially, a, a Frege argues that this is the language of mathematics. So now mathematics has a language. Von Heyernut, in a famous anthology from Frege to Gedel, wrote perhaps the most important single work ever written in logic. It's probably hype, again, because probably Aristotle's book was the most important single, single work. But this might be number two, because he points out that the language of logic can be used as a language of, of, of all of mathematics. And now gets into the picture, a, another young man. Now, all these pictures show them as they're old, because this is the point where they're famous, and people already by now have cameras. But, uh, but he was born in, in uh, 1872. So this is Bernard Arthur William Russell, Bernard Russell. And we are meeting him when he is 30 years old. And on June 16, 1902, he writes a letter to Frege. Frege is now already a, a fairly senior, very senior mathematician. And, and Russell is a very young philosopher. And Frege starts reading the letter. In the beginning, it's a very nice letter. Russell writes, I find myself in agreement with you in all essentials. I find in your work discussion, distinction, definition that one seeks in vain in the work of other logicians. There is just one point where I have encountered a difficulty. The difficulty was so severe that in Frege's book that came out a year later, Frege's right in the appendix, there's nothing worse that can happen to a scientist than had to have the foundation collapse just as the work is finished. I've been placed in this position by a letter from Mr. Bertrand Russell. So essentially, Russell's flaw, he finds a contradiction in, in uh, Frege's work. The whole thing was contradictory. <laughs> from, get, from Frege's point of view, destroyed his life work. And he, this is now, he's, he's an old man. He become very bitter, he become extre extreme, uh, developed extreme right-wing opinions. He kept a diary 
And it's very disturbing to read his diaries. He was opposed to the parliamentary system. He was opposed to democracy. He was opposed to the liberals, Catholics, French, and above all, of course, the Jews who were the source of all evil in the world. And this is also the 20s. Uh, there is a Weimar Republic, big inflation in, in Germany. He loses all of, his, all of his life savings, just evaporate. And, um, and this is while Nazism is rising. So it's a very unsavory end to a very distinguished intellectual career. Now, what is it that Russell, what was the flaw that Russell found in Frege's work? So just like a bull realized that all the syllogisms are about classes, Russell realized that everything in Frege's work assumed an aligned notion of a set. So suddenly people recognized that set theory is the real foundation of mathematics. The problem was to give a rigorous definition of a set. And Russell ran into the question, if you take all the sets that do not include themselves as a member, is this a set or not? And, and Russell and, and Frege's system gave you contradictory answers. To explain this, it's a bit of a tongue twister. So Russell, in, in his autobiography, gave a beautiful example. You say, imagine a small town. And in this small town, some men shave themselves. And the, bar the barber, who is also a man, shaves, put a sign. I shave all men, and only those men that do not shave themselves. And now the question is, does this barber shave himself or he doesn't shave himself? If he does, then he shouldn't. And if he doesn't, then he should. So what's going on here? Okay? And again, this is nothing but diagonalization, self-reference, and Epimenides has, has woken from, spoken from his grave after a slumber of 2,500 years, and Russell lo launched what became known as the foundational crisis in mathematics. So we have become better and better understanding the foundation of mathematics, but at the very core of mathematics, we discover a paradox and now all of this beautiful edifice of mathematics sits on top of a paradoxical situation. So Russell was determined to find a solution. He embarked on the project. He's going to cure and solve the problem, the foundation of crisis in mathematics. He had a very hard time. He's from his autobiography. Every morning, I would sit down before a blank sheet of paper. Throughout the day, was a brief interval for lunch. Lunch is important. I would stare at the blank sheet. Often when evening came, it was still empty. It seemed quite likely that the whole of the rest of my life might be consumed looking at the blank sheet of paper. So he was stuck. He got help from Alfred North Whitehead. And together they produced Principia Mathematica, a monumental piece of work. Ten, ten years, they produced three volumes, 2,000 pages, in which they show how to systematically derive all of mathematics from logic and avoid the paradoxes. They, they, they syntactically, they forbade self-reference in such a way that they said everything is secure. This was such a monumental effort that Russell wrote, my own intellect never quite recovered from the strain of writing it. I turn aside for mathematical logic with a kind of nausea. So if you're a graduate student, what is the moral? Don't take 10 years, don't write 2,000 pages. So when the book comes out, there's a lot of excitement. People say, ooh, finally a solution has been found. And then people like gradually realize, wait a minute. Frege wrote a small book, and Russell found a paradox in the book. <coughs> now we have 2,000 pages. Who knows how many paradoxes are hiding between the lines in these 2,000 pages? So. We are now into, into the, in, in, uh, 1913 and above it, and the crisis is still very much raging. And then into this crisis steps David Hilbert, who is then the, queen of math the king of mathematics. So David Hilbert, uh, at 19, in, in the year 1900, he's not even 40 years old, he's already invited to give a plenary talk at in the, in the International Congress of Mathematicians, and he gives a talk which are about 27 open problems in mathematics, and his list of open problems pretty much shaped mathematics in the 20th century. People refer to Hilbert's 10th, Hilbert's second, kind of classical problems. There are many, many legends and stories about Hilbert. I'll tell you my favorite story. 
So one day Hilbert comes to work, and his students notice there is a tear in his pants, and you can actually see his underwear. And no one knows what to do now, because no one has the, 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 the courage to go and tell such a famous mathematician there is a tear in your pants. So for a whole week, the students discuss, what should we do? And then one of them has a solution. And he's, he knows that Hilbert's love to walk and talk mathematics. So he says, Herr Professor Dr. Hilbert, I hear that the roses are blooming. Can I invite you to walk with me to the rose garden? And we will talk mathematics along the way. Hilbert says, oh, roses and mathematics. What can be better than that? So they go to the rose garden. And the students take him to the thickest part of the garden. And when they come out, he says, oh, Herr Professor Dr. Hilbert, I'm so sorry. Your pants are torn. It must be from one of the rose bushes. It is all my fault. I will pay for the repair. Please, uh, uh, please uh, excuse me. Please forgive me. And Hilbert says, no, 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 no. This is not your fault. He said, let me tell you a secret. This has been going on for a week now. No one noticed until now. <laughs> So Hilbert was not a logician per se. He was a, a, a classical mathematician. But Hilbert was in love with mathematics. We're going to see in a few minutes his emotional st status about mathematics. And so he, in a sequence of talks and lectures and, and, and papers, he launched what became known as Hilbert's program. In Hilbert's program, the goal was to put mathematics on solid foundations. Number one, mathematics is consistent. There are no contradictions in mathematics. Number two, mathematics is complete. All mathematical questions can be answered. Number three, this is where computer science starts to, to be born. Mathematics is decidable. There is a mechanical way to determine the truth of all mathematical statements. Again, let's, let's uh, uh, read a bit from Hilbert. Hilbert wrote, I want to dispose of the foundational questions once and for all. And he writes, for every mathematical problem, must, every mathematical problem must necessarily be susceptible to an exact statement, either in the form of an actual answer to the question asked, or by the proof of the impossibility of its solution. Either you, you, you find a solution, or you prove there is no solution. For example, we have a proof you cannot uh, 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 square the circle. Okay? But we have a proof for this. And then he writes, once a logical formalism is established, one can accept that a systematic, so to say, computational treatment of logic formulas is possible, which would somehow correspond to the theory of equations in algebra. So to solve in high school, again, we have given equations, we solve them mechanically. And Hilbert says we should be able to do the same for all of mathematics. And the last quote is very nice because it shows us how Hilbert felt about mathematics. And he wrote, every mathematician certainly shares the conviction that every mathematical problem is necessarily capable of strict resolution. We hear within us the perpetual call. There is the problem. Seek its solution. You can find it by pure reason. So if you can solve the problem, it means you haven't thought hard enough, you're not smart enough. But the problem is there waiting for you to solve it. In 1930, Hilbert retired. He was from the city of Königsberg. Königsberg is today Kaliningrad, which is in a little enclave between Lithuania and Poland, it belongs to Russia. He was such a famous mathematician, was invited to the city. He got the keys to the, to the gates of the city. He was asked to give a radio address. And he talked on the radio on September 8. And the, the lecture was called Natural Philosophy and Logic. And the recording exists. You can listen to that to Hilbert's given lecture. And what's most famous are the final, final six words of his lecture. He said, Wir müssen wissen, wir werden wissen. We must know, we shall know. And these words, this is the epitaph on his gravestone. Wir müssen wissen, wir werden wissen. Notice the date, September 8, 1930. The irony is that within a few years, Hilbert program will be completely shattered by Kurt Gödel, who will prove incompleteness. There's no systematic way to answer all questions in mathematics. This was incompleteness one. Incompleteness two meant impossibility. You cannot prove consistency of mathematics in mathematics. So remember, mathematics is consistent. But it's a matter of belief rather than something we can prove. And finally, a few years later, Church and Turing proved undecidability. 
the truth of first order formulas is not decidable, it's not, it's not computable. So all three legs of Hilbert's program have been, have been destroyed. And a major character is Kurt Friedrich Gedel, who was as a child no, was known as Der Herr Warum. Warum means why. And as a child, you could never satisfy curiosity. He always asked why. To give him an answer, he said, but why? But why? But why? He was an infinite loop there. And so he became known as Herr Der Warum. Here's another, I like this picture very much. This was Gedel and Einstein. They became good friends in the United States. And uh, the story was that uh, they went, Einstein accompanied uh, Gedel to get citizenship. And the judge uh, started talking to Professor, Professor Gedel. And he said, you're coming from Germany. And Gedel said, no, 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 I'm coming from Austria. And the judge says, well, it's the same thing. These are both now dictatorship. Fortunately, you're now in the United States. We are a democracy. And Gedel says, yes, but I found a loophole in the Constitution by which the US can become a dictatorship. And Einstein started going like this. <laughs> not now, Kurt. This is not the right time. <laughs> now, on September 7th in Königsberg, one day earlier, there's a conference on the epistemology of the exact sciences. And in that conference, in the, in the last day, there is a panel session, and Gedel says this somewhat cryptic sentence. One may, in fact, exhibit sentences which also intentionally correct, meaning true, are not provable in the formal system of mathematics. So this is the incompleteness theorem. He said there are some sentences that are true, but not provable. Very few people appreciate what he said. Uh, it, it's, we, we do know that Hilbert did not appreciate it at all. But one very bright guy, uh, 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 John von Neumann, was at this point, he's 20 years old, 28 years old. He's just a bit younger than, than Gedel. And he realized that, in fact, he has been working on the consensus of arithmetic, and he's, he realized he wasted two years of his time. He was incredibly bright. He was famous already when he was six years old. He would multiply eight-digit number in his head. He would exchange uh, jokes with his father in classical Greek. And uh, he realized he wasted two years of his time. He was very upset. And he wrote, I will have nothing more to do with logic. I will never read another paper in logic. And of course, we all know about Turing. Here is a famous picture. Next year will be Turing's centenary. He was born in 1912. He was, uh, he, next year will be 2012. What you may not know was he was not necessarily a nice guy. He was socially inept, had unpleasant voice, and I take to erratic grooming, I take to mean he didn't shower enough, which means he had bad smell. So, but a brilliant mathematician. So what happened is the big question people ask, what is a rigorous proof? And the answer that seemed to emerge from Hilbert's program was a proof has to be so rigorous that you should be able to, you should be able to check it by machine. Check it by machine. That had to be, what does it mean to check it by a machine? People have to define machine checkable. For this, you have to define machine. And computer science came out of this. The, all the basic fundamental questions in fundamental in computer science, the concept of an algorithm. Now, of course, algorithm existed before that. We talked about Euclid's algorithm. But the concept of algorithm as a mathemat mathematical object was born then. The distinction between hardware and software, the Turing machine and the instruction on the tape exist new, new concept. The concept of a universal machine, one machine that can do everything. Amazing concept, born then. Even the first programming language, the Lambda Calculus, Foundation for Functional Programming, was born then in a short period of time, about three, four years, everything is happening. Build computers. What you see here is the ENIAC, and you see here Betty Jennings and, and Frances Bilas programming the ENIAC. In fact, uh, uh, Jean Bartik, who is the last of the programmers of the ENIAC, just died a couple of weeks ago. Programming then was not writing code. You have to set up hundreds of switches and connect cables. You did, if one was wrong, the whole thing would not work. It required a degree of precision and patience only women could, could do it. <laughs> so all the programmers, all the programmers were women. And then later it became easy, and then men took over. 
And here we are ending kind of the end of the story. We run, we find again John von Neumann. We saw him in 1930. He was 20 years, 28 years old, 27 years old. Now he is the new king of mathematics and the last king of mathematics. No mathematician after von Neumann had the status of the mathematician, the king of the mountain. And at this point, he's very, very famous. So on, on February 14, 1946, the ENIAC was turned on. The ENIAC was an engineering marvel, but it was a monster. It was a huge machine, consumed a lot of power. The story was that when, when it was turned on, light in, Phil in Philadelphia dimmed because it was using so much power. It was running, can you imagine, five kilohertz. Amazingly fast, five kilohertz. But the people who built it did not have much of theoretical foundations for it. And about a year and a half earlier, in August 44, Hermann Goldstein, the project manager from the Navy for the ENIAC, the ENIAC was meant to, to, to design, to compute ballistic tables for the Navy. Hermann Goldstein ran into von Neumann in Aberdeen, Maryland, in a train station. And he started talking to von Neumann, and von Neumann says, hear about it, he says, I want in. I want into the project. No one could tell von Neumann no. So von Neumann gets into the project, and they start working on the second generation. At this point, the, the, the first generation was just being built. And in 1945, a report is issued under von Neumann's name, a first draft of a report on the EDVAC, to be followed by another report a year later, preliminary discussion of the logical design of an electronic computing instruments. And there we see how based on the idea of, of, of Bull and Turing, and a new important idea by von Neumann, it's called the von Neumann architecture, the program is stored not on a tape, but on the computer itself. And by 1946, von Neumann, who played a critical role in the Manhattan Project, he was in charge of the mathematical com computation for the, for the atomic bomb. Now he says, I'm thinking about something much more important than bomb. I'm thinking about computers. By the early 50s, people have read this report. They know how to build computers. They build lots of machines. They're called John Yax, after John von Neumann's. And the circle has closed. We started from discussing reasoning, identify patterns of reasoning, went to logic, logic led to computers. Now we have computers that reasoning, and of course, since then, they reason more and more powerfully, as we are all seeing. And this was just to give you, in some sense, a, 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 a picture. We are stopping in, 19, in 1946. I will not go on because it will take another hour to go on from there. But all in short I can say is that in, that in the 50 years since then we have seen, again, a growing connection between logic and computer science. So much so that some people call logic the calculus of computer science. The same way calculus is the foundation for engineering, logic is the foundation for computer science. And going back to our friend Cosma Arshalizi, he writes, in one extremely important field, however, it, meaning logic, reigns supreme. And that is computation. Programming is simply mathematical logic in action. The melding of theory and practice is so complete that most practitioners have no idea that their speech, recursion, lexical scope, data abstraction, even those bands of C novices, pointers, referencing, and dereferencing, this is all logical prose. And I'm running a little late, so I will just uh, tell you that Epim Epimenides is alive and well. He just moved to the humanities because one of the central tenets in postmodernism is there's no universal truth. And all you have to ask yourself, is this universally true? <laughs> and I will finish from another quote by Leibniz, who was described as a patron saint of cybernetics. Cybernetics was an early term for computer science. And he wrote, once the characteristic numbers are established for most concepts, mankind will then possess a new instrument that will enhance the capability of the mind to a far greater extent than optical instruments strengthen the eyes. And this is really the best definition I can think of for what computer science is. Thank you very much. We have time for two quick questions. Thank you for a very pleasant history lesson. Um, has logic ever steered us wrong? 
Has logic, has logic ever steered us wrong as a field? And um, is there a role for other, say, postmodern philosophies to influ influence our field? I'm thinking of particularly Wittgenstein's work. So uh, let me quote uh, Blaise Pascal, is a famous French mathematician. And he also wrote a, one of the first books in French. As a, so he's one of, could say, one of the father of French literature, a, a, a book called Thoughts. And he has some beautiful quotes. Uh, and one of my favorite, he, he writes, two errors, not enough logic, too much logic. These are the two errors that, that he thinks about. So this tension between you know, between uh, uh, in, our, in our human affairs, what is the proper role of logic? It's a matter we have been struggling a lot. And actually, just in the last few years, there is a lot of people that try to understand the, the role of emotions in, 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 in our thinking and making decision making. And we know now it plays a very critical role. And uh, of course, if you go through some uh, Star Trek, Mr. Spock, right, is a demonstration of, the, of what happens if you have only logic and you don't understand human beings. So logic is a terrific tool to describe computers because computers really are just reasoning machines. Maybe at some point we'll have computers with feelings. But, uh, but it's dangerous to use logic to try to understand humans because we're just a bit more complicated than that. In effect, people have done effects in AI. There have been attempts to there, there was a, a part in AI that was trying to use just logic. And that, I would say, the branch has never been fully successful. People have done a lot of work on what's called common sense reasoning. But uh, by itself, logic has not proved to be a good tool just to describe human reasoning. So in some sense, when Bull was trying to use logic to describe the human mind, we now understand that this was a bit naive. I'm going to follow up on Stacy's question um, a little bit. Which is, at the beginning of the lecture, you said, you cited Leibniz talking about his dream of all human knowledge being captured in calculational rules, right? By the end, you were talking about logic is the foundation for computation. Do you see where I'm going with this question? Um, that uh, the... <clears throat> It's not necessarily true that what computers can do with logic is all human knowledge. And it, um, while I, I take the force of your, of your talk to be uh, you know, sort of an inspirational one about what we can build and should build and why we should be enthusiastic about that, I find myself wondering um, about about the whether uh, what is left out is inevitable. Now I know there's work going on at MIT and so forth with what I would call simulacrum of emotion, but um, perhaps is there is there some interest in your in your thinking going forward about explicitly trying to model what for example, is not captured in this way. So we can see that even, you know, going back to Givons and Peirce, I mean, these questions about the difference in some, I would say it's one of the central questions of, of artificial intelligence, which is the distinction between any, any form of mechanical reasoning and, and human behavior. So it's clear that, that logic in the, in the traditional sense has, has not been, it doesn't describe the way. I mean, it's, in effect, there are many cases we see, I mean, there are obvious paradoxes that we see that people don't necessarily think, think, think just purely by, by logic. For example, you know, we are terrible at handling alternating quantifier. If, if I tell you for all exist, for all exist, for all exist, you lost it. You cannot follow usually more than about three, three alternations. So, so humans are not logical machines. Another question, computers are logical machines. And I think the question is how much of human intelligence computers can, can capture is an ongoing question. And so far, I would say the answer is not, the, the progress is not in our favor. Everything that we thought, no, no, this is distinctly human. After a while, we see that using machines that are logical machines, we can capture more and more of, of, of human intelligence. But this is, this is, I think, part of the 
ongoing quest for our species is to know how distinct we are, how unique we are. I don't think I'll have an answer to that more than anybody else here. There's one question now. Ever concern yourself with the notion that as the tools of logical expression uh, expand into a, a language that becomes so detailed, it's, it's approaching the analog, going from analog to digital and all the way back to analog, that, that as humans that we place ourselves in a position to make the same types of logical fallacies and mistakes that we make as humans without the augmentation of logical machines, uh, but just on a grander and much more high-speed scale. So, I don't think as humans we need any help in, in stumbling on fallacies. So we're doing a, grand, a great job doing it uh, ourselves. I don't know, that, you know, I mean, if you think about, uh, about how we manage to almost blow up our economy by following uh, accepted wisdom in, in microeconomics, I mean, it wasn't necessarily about, about logic. So, you know, and this is true generally about technology, that as we augment our capacity with technology, we have the capacity to, to do greater harm, right? I mean, maybe one person with a knife can kill another person, but then uh, we, we, we miscalculate the risk of building a nuclear reactor, and then the risks are suddenly magnified. So I think this is true about any, as we increase our own power to do good, we increase our own power to do harm. And this is part of the description. If you look at the 20th century, this, the story, this I think one of the main, major struggles for humanity is how to temper our own power. And computers are just part of it, but I don't see anything unique about computers in that respect. I think at that point, this point, we have to call it quits. Um, if you have any more questions, please come on down front and ask them. Uh, and again, let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Yeah.